Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special 5 by 15 online event. Um, and we're thrilled to be welcoming many hundreds of people here live on this webinar and watching on the catch up. So it's a delight for 5 by 15 to be welcoming Mike Lee to talk about his life and work in conversation with the fantastic Francine Stock radio and TV broadcaster on the arts, film and current affairs. And we're thrilled to have Mike with us this evening, not least as he is the subject of a major retrospective this month at the BFI um, and as the newly revised and fully updated book, Mike Lee on Mike Lee, his release this week from Faber Publishing, um, updated to include recent films, including Mr. Turner and Peter Liu and classic works, including, of course, Nuts in May, Abigail's Party, and much, much more that we will be discussing and hearing about, I am sure, this evening. So I know Mike needs very little introduction. He's a seven-time Oscar nominee and winner of five BAFTAs, and he's the only British director to have won the top prize at both Cannes for Secrets and Lies and and Venice for um, Vera Drake. And he's one of the UK's most internationally recognized and critically acclaimed filmmakers. Mike Lee on Mike Lee is out this week. And if you want to buy a copy from our wonderful book partner, New and Books, they're an independent bookshop and the details Stephanie will put in the chat. Um, please put your all important questions in the Q&A box, which you will find at the bottom of your screens. And we're going to come to as many as we can towards the end of this session. But for now, I will um, disappear into the virtual wings and say thank you for your support for 5 by 15 online. And thank you, Francine, for hosting this discussion. And I will hand over to you. Welcome. Daisy, thank you very much indeed. And Mike, hello. And it's lovely to see you, Mike, because the last time we met was actually just before lockdown, I think, more or less. Um, and I'm wondering, just to get this whole topic out of the way now, this whole period of the last you know, almost two years now, 18 months to two years, has it been the most frustrating time for you or has it actually afforded you some opportunity for kind of reflection, extraordinary opportunity for reflection? Well. Um, great to see you again, and hello, everybody. Um, I think the truth is that both of those things, um, because they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, we were going to make a film which disappeared with COVID, um, and for various reasons, that's not going to happen. Um, so, uh, and as everybody knows, um, I can't and don't. I mean, I could have spent COVID uh, at lockdown just uh, writing a script, but that's not what I do. I mean, I collaborate with other people and we arrive at the film, which includes the script. So I couldn't do that. Um, so indeed, as you say, it gave me plenty of time to uh, reflect, to procrastinate, to read more than I probably, than I, certainly more than I would do in the same amount of time um, and to think about stuff and to think about what I would like to do next which I don't really want to talk about in any detail or at all really um, and now we've come out the other side or so we pretend to ourselves I don't really believe it and I'll let's see how we get through the winter we are talking about trying to make a film uh, starting next year it's very difficult to get, I'm finding it hard to get backing um, for various reasons, mostly to do with the fact that traditionally I always say, can't tell you what it's about, just give us the money and that doesn't seem to be working like it used to. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I'm just sort of getting on with it really. I mean, it's good that the book's come out. Ed, by the way, it wasn't mentioned just now, but it's important that the book is edited by Amy Raphael, who is a very, distinguished journalist who's very good at that sort of work. And, and it's great that there's this retrospective going on, um, complete with a new restoration of my film Naked, which is having a cinema release in the UK. And my other, my first film has also been restored, Bleak Moments, for a Blu-ray release along with Naked. So those things are happening which are positive, but um, also there's been, a, there's been a sort of um, downside to, um, Mm. Do, do, you think it, do you think it might change the way that, I mean, I'm not your overall way of making films, but do you think that there will be significant changes to the way that films are made going forward? 
Well, I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that filmmaking that has been going on, and there's a great deal of it happening, as you know, um, has definitely been affected by COVID um, conditions and protocols, which, from, as far as I'm concerned, for the kind of films that I make, the way I make films, which is very much about you know, personal contact between people and working in a creative and spontaneous way, um, those um, protocols, those COVID um, ways of going about things are really quite intrusive and inhibiting and that's worried me throughout and it still worries me. Um, I can't see how I can fundamentally change the way I operate with my comrades but um, uh, <laughs> we're just keeping our fingers crossed really. So there's, the retrospective goes back as you say it's 50 years goes back to big moments um, and I'm wondering over the was it was your way of working already set with that first film? Yes, it was. I mean, I'd begun to um, work the way I do in the collaborative way with actors and indeed everybody else um, in the 60s, starting quite early on in the theatre. And although I'd been to the London Film School and I'd acted in films a bit and I was very much into cinema I didn't manage to get to make a film till we made bleak moments at the beginning of the 1970s so I did lots of I did about 10 so-called so-called misnamed improvised plays I mean plays that came out of improvisation but which were actually very precise as my work is as you know um, so yes I developed my way of working throughout the 60s and it was very much on the go by the time I started to make films and that and, and fundamentally it hasn't changed a great deal over no, the years. I mean it hasn't I mean it changes every project every film and indeed every play demands new ways of doing things in detail um and you know we've I mean certainly pushed the boat I mean you know it never occurred to me for a very long time that I might ever make a period film because it seemed the natural thing in terms of both not only the way I work, but more, particular, more importantly, what I was interested in, to tell stories about our contemporary world. And then, you know, I began to think, well, why shouldn't we um, look at the past and apply the same um, ways of working and the ways of doing things to arrive at the same kind of reality, but in a historical context. And so we made Topsy Turvey, the film about Gilbert and Sullivan, and later we made Mr. Turner about the painter and more, my last film, of course, was Peterloo about the famous Peterloo massacre in Manchester in 1819. Yeah, well, yeah, there's actually there's something about that trilogy that I want to talk about a little bit more in, in a second. But I, I wonder if I just kind of persist with this idea of the 50 year span and your method may not have changed, but possibly the way that actors work, their familiarity, or generally people's familiarity with cameras and when seeing themselves on screen. And all those things have changed, haven't they? In that yes, I didn't think that's what you were going to say, actually. Um, and what, that, what you've said is, all, is, I dare say, also true. What I thought you were going to say that, is that somehow actors have changed. Well, that. yeah, it, it is. That's, that's one of, that's, that was the first part, yeah. Apart from the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is the case. I mean, I, I trained as an actor at RADA. It, in um, right at the beginning of the 1960s and it was very very old-fashioned and um, uh, uncreative and unexploratory and all of those things and when I first started to do the kind of work that I that we're talking about there were qu quite a lot of actors would say oh well, if there's no script I I, I, no, I I need to see a script I can't that's too risky and you know it, the, the, there were some actors, of course, who went for it and were fantastic. But that kind of resistance amongst young, ever younger actors has pretty well disappeared. I mean, people are really much more open about all sorts of things. And therefore, you know, there are actors much more um, up for being really exploratory and creative. You know. So that's changed. But, you know, you're, you're right. Of course, technology has moved on as well. But it's not really about that. It's about the general, which I think is what you said. It's the society's changed. We've all moved on. We've become more um, open to things. Yeah. 
but, but we've also at the same time become much more used to seeing um, everyday lives put on in a completely unmitigated and unfiltered way on screen. You know, there is a sort of that that some the sort of sense of of seeing people's lives in the kind of intimate detail that you first showed it, which was startling actually um that people are constantly putting i mean i'm not saying they're of the same quality of your film but but that's yeah. kind of cultural change isn't it no i totally agree i mean so far as if we i mean this applies to all sorts of things but certainly if we're just about films and films in the first place here in the uk of course the real revolution uh was what ken loach and tony garnett did in the context of bbc where they said look television plays are static and studio bound. Let's get out there with the, the same people that shoot documentaries and do it out in the streets. Now, that wasn't completely new because there are earlier traditions in British cinema, free cinema, and even earlier than that, um, Humphrey Jennings' his documentaries during the war and so on and so forth. But um, by the time I started to do it, uh, particularly as from my second film onwards, I worked exclusively, my films were exclusively at the BBC, um, apart from one film that was made for Channel 4 when it started. Um, meantime, um, I was following in the, in the immediate footsteps of um, Tony Garnett and, and Ken Loach particularly. Um, but the, and the, the, the commitment from them was, which is what you're talking about, is to show real life in a real way. But of course, we have to remember other things like censorship, say in the theatre, for example, which I worked in, was, was only abolished in 1967. And that the spirit of censorship, I mean, you know, you couldn't say the F word um, until, until the first film I made where the F word was said was meantime in 1983. And we had to calculate, because we knew it was shown on television, we had to calculate how far into the film the F word could be used, um, because it could only be said on television after the nine o'clock watershed. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, those things, I mean, all, I mean, thank goodness, society is becoming more grown up and sophisticated and tolerant in some ways, though we know in other ways, the exact opposite is frighteningly also the case. But we can look at the world in a in a real way in in some ways that was harder or more unusual or more uh, courageous to do um, fifty years ago. So, um, if somebody says that your films are naturalistic, what do you say? Well, I disagree because they are real. It's realism, not naturalism, which is to say that realism is about the S, something that's completely ex you experience as being real, but isn't doesn't record um, the world in a which is what naturalism is in a literal, undistilled way. Realism is about getting to the essence of reality, and my films, you know, in various ways are heightened, and um, some in different ways than others. So I would say realism, yes, naturalism, no. But some may say this is academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but political, yes. I did an, um, a, 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 a thing the other day like this for a radio channel. Mm. And somebody had um, put in a question, well, put in a comment saying, Mike Lee is extremely left wing. Now, of course, if you didn't know anything about it, you think, well, obviously this guy is a signed up, fully signed up Marxist, uh, Leninist, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think that my films are political in a, with a small p. I think because we are talk, you know, we talk about, we look at in my films, how we live, issues, how we relate to each other, how we, you know, um, there are conflicts of truth and lies and work and conditions and all of those things. But I defy anybody to um, show how to, to cite any of my many films um, and say for any of them what the message is. 
because I don't make films that say, think this. I mean, there are great political filmmakers who do make films that say, think this. I mean, my friend and colleague, Ken Loach, would not deny being one of them. And I have great respect for what he does, but I don't do that. I mean, I leave you with stuff to ponder, to reflect. Even P Peter Lou, my last film, which is, you could say reasonably, the most obviously political film that I've made, because it is about political conflict. But even that doesn't, I mean, it, it's plain that it is saying democracy is a good thing, but it, it, even that is, is kind of leaves you, there are open-ended aspects of the end that just leave you to um, reflect. Uh, and um, anybody that looks at, say, for example, Secrets and Lies or Vera Drake, obviously Secrets and Lies is, is saying it, it, people who, who are adopted should be allowed to trace their birth mothers. And plainly, um, Vera Drake, which is about a backstreet abortionist, of course, is making a, sta making a statement about uh, freedom of choice, etc women's rights but they are very open-ended in many ways and very uh, i mean naked which is just being re-released and restored i mean i defy anybody to come out of naked and serious and say what the message is or what it's trying to tell you i mean it's about all sorts of things and and all sorts of contradictory things and all sorts of conflicting things um so you know I'm not too bothered about labels, but I I, I refuse to um, wear the shackles of um, the reductionist shackles of people saying, "Oh, it's just political, it's just it's just propaganda." Because it isn't. It's more about reflecting than it is about um, um, tub thumping. But I mean, and in some ways, I think this is a tremendous you know tribute to your films. They can also create quite a lot of strong feeling as of course Naked was, was an example of that and people will find political dimensions in them. I mean, like, do, you, do you in some ways think that is actually a, a kind of compliment? You know, it shows that they've really hit home in one way or another. Well, uh, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the absence of that would be bad, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, so th there's this great retrospective in this, over this huge span. I mean, are there particular things that you would point people to it. You mentioned Meantime, I love Meantime. Um, meantime and Career Girls, I would say, you know, for certainly for, for a younger generation who might not be so familiar with it, I would certainly point people towards. I mean, what, 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 would, you, what would you say? That's a hard one, you know. Um, I, 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 I'm delighted that you're, you're um, talking about Career Girls because it rather sank without trace. I mean, not so many people know about it, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I came across a, um, a discussion online recently between two women talking about career girls, and it was just, they were just so, it had so moved them and so, you know, in such a profound way, I was really moved by it, because they, you know, they related to those two women. It's a film, for, for those that don't know it, which basically looks at two women in, who are hitting 30 we get together having not seen each other for a long time and it keeps going back to 10 years earlier when they were students and it's just a reflection on that journey really yeah but the relationship between them is so good and also that it's the changes i think the changes the changes at 30 absolutely i because i saw it again I don't know, a couple of months ago actually and um i was very struck even at my advanced stage <laughs> that that really brought that whole feeling of being 30 and seeing your great college friends again you know how poignant that is and actually still quite sort of painful because already you're aware of the huge changes that are going on well that journey from 20 to 30 is yeah. one of the longest journeys longest decade journeys in, in i mean i'm 78 now the the journey between 68 and 78 is really hard would be very hard to um <laughs> to identify much uh, apart from with reference to some physical ailments. But um, that journey from 20 to 30 is huge, isn't it? Mm. So, okay, so um, Career Girls, we certainly was it. I mean, anything else that you, you would like to sort of pull out a little bit more into, into the spotlight? Well, 
Um, uh, uh, right at the beginning of this um, session, uh, Abigail's party was mentioned, and I have to say about Abigail's party that although everybody talks about it and um, it's not a film, it was a stage play that we wheeled into the television studio after many performances and um, just did it in a rather crude way in front of television cameras. And the play, no doubt, obviously the play holds up and it's become quite sort of, dare I say it myself, kind of sort of iconic in some way. But um, I just sort of want to say, well, it's not a film. And it doesn't look like a film. It doesn't sound like a film. Uh, it's it's something else. It it's there for people to enjoy or not as they wish. Um, I mean, the happy go lucky will be in the in the season, and uh, uh, that I think what is I think what's interesting, and this never occurred to me till after we'd made happy go lucky is that it sits as a curious, in a curious way, as a kind of sibling with Naked. Mm. Because both the central characters, and indeed those two central characters are the most um, uniquely central characters I have in any of my films. Um, I mean, the centrality is greater than it normally is for the more ensemble nature of most of my films. Um, that both of them, both Johnny and Poppy, David Thewlis's and Sally Hawkins's characters are both idealists. The difference is that Johnny is a frustrated idealist and is becoming embittered, really, because he, you know, he he is um, disappointed with the material, the materialistic world. Whereas Poppy, equally an idealist, deals with it, embraces the world, is positive about it. So, I mean, I, 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 I hope people can, can and will see Happy Go Lucky if they haven't seen it already. And then, of course, the other film, more recent, which isn't one of the period films, is Another Year, which um, was a reflection after having looked at, I mean, Poppy and her, um, her contemporaries in Happy Go Lucky are also around 30. Um, so another year is more of a reflection of a, from us lot, us more seeing it the way, you know, the pain of growing older for some people. Um, yeah. Look, we've got masses of questions coming in. So I'm inclined to sort of bring some of those um, in straight away now. So um, I'll start with an, an anonymous question, which is, um, you know, your, your inspiration, some of the filmmakers that, that inspired you. Here's the thing. I um, grew up in Manchester um, in the 40s and 50s, and I saw films all the time. I, I went to the pictures, as we called it, as often as they'd let me. And they were, you know, two programmes a week, and a new, different programme on Sunday. But I never, in all that time, saw a film that wasn't in English. I saw Hollywood and British movies. And when I came to London in 1960 to be a student, wham, world cinema. So I was blown away. But in the first week I was in London, somebody said, oh, there's a f film festival on in St Pancras, um, in the St Pancras Town Hall. Um, and they show, there's a festival. Should we go and see this film? I don't know what it is. So we went to see this film and it was about a knight playing chess with death. <laughs> um, and of course, it was a blow away. I mean, I've never seen it. Bergman. Bergman is fantastic. I mean, at that time, you had um, the, the Nouvelle Vague guys, the Godard's film, um, Abu Dassouf, Breathless, playing. Jules Le Jim came out. The 400 Blows, Les Quatre Sans Coups of Truth, all those films. Um, uh, John um, Cassavetti's shadows was which was we gathered it had been improvised in some way that was an early inspiration not so much an influence and then there was the japanese cinema the russian cinema the um uh, um italian neo-realist cinema of you know bicycle thieves and all those films the indian cinema of satyajit ray who made these wonderful 
films that really did influence and inspire me about real people in real having real experiences in real places. I mean, the list is very, very long, and um, that's just a, a, a slight um, snippet and whiff. Yeah, well, actually, leading on from that, uh, somebody's also asked about, uh, so, OK, you said you're going to the cinema in Manchester, but, but what about the rest of Manchester? What kind of influence did that have? How did that contribute to your career? Well, um, I grew up in a very working class area. My dad was a doctor and we lived over the shop. And um, I went to very working class schools, both uh, primary school and uh, grammar school. And... Um, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, this is all before the Clean Air Act, so one lived in a permanent state of smog. <laughs> um, I never realised that the great Victorian buildings in the centre of Manchester weren't black. When I grew up, they were all black, and you took it for granted that buildings were black. And when after the Clean Air Act, when they when they um, Cleaned them all. You realise that there were this one. There was one of the Portland stone buildings. So, um, how else did it influence? Well, of course, we up north talk. We tell it like it is. We don't mess about. We tell you what we think, and there's no argy bargy about it. And in a way, that's it. Part of the answer to your question. Um, uh, and uh, and. On another level, though this one isn't, I don't think, what the questioner was asking. Um, apart from seeing a lot of movies, I saw circus, pantomime, as we called it, uh, live theatre, plays, musical theatre, concerts, um, variety, um, which was like music hall, really. And I actually saw, my mother took me to see Laurel and Hardy on stage at the Ardwick Hippodrome in Manchester. You saw those, that famous tour. Famous tour, and it was 1952, I was nine. And uh, there were two things about it that were extraordinary. One is that they were in colour. <laughs> and the other was that it was a great set, a great stage set of a railway station or as it's now known, a train station. It's changed, the word has changed recently, I noticed. And um, Stan Laurel sat upright at one end of a bench, and Oliver Hardy lay on the bench and could not get his act together. He giggled and nervously and what we call corpsed in the theatre, you know, and it was, it was completely out of control. And of course, famously on that, that's the tour in which they finally, and there was a movie made about it not so long ago, which uh, where they said to him, you've got to, got to retire. And what I was actually looking at was um, that, that breakdown, really. And my mother was outraged. <laughs> my mother, who had nothing to do with theatre or anything and had a fairly limited sense of humour, was, um, was outraged by the by, by she thought there was a lack of professionalism. She was, she was um, like that, wasn't yeah. getting what she wanted. Okay, now here's a question about uh, what you, you said you brought up in a working class area. This is a question about, uh, I mean, whatever working class means now, you know, that, that also is another question, isn't it? But this question says, you shed light on a lot of working class characters in your films and provide such a unique perspective. Do you think film is changing now to bring a much greater representation of working class characters? For example, British social realism in recent films like herself or Andrew Arnold's Fish Tank. So do you think that there is- I think so, I think so. I'm cautious um, about this because I think it, there are so many different criteria and I don't, I don't really think I can say very much about this. I think that is, the, I think it's, look, it's partly because it depicting my my job is to depict all sorts of people in all sorts of contexts in all sorts of class contexts. Um, and by the way, just a, a detail is yes, I did grow up in a working class area, but as I said, my dad was a doctor, so actually I was a middle class kid in a working class area. That's I think worth. I'm only saying that in case anyone who accuses me of affecting to, to be working class myself, which I have experienced many times in the past, we digress. Um, I, I, I'm cautious about 
generalizing in, in my answer to this question, because I think it's true that there are there is work that really does reflect truthfully and honestly and realistically uh, working class life, as indeed all sorts of life. But there's quite a lot of idealized stuff or trivialized or commercialized representation of working class people. I mean, look at the soaps. So I think you've got to be careful. I can't, I think one can't quite generalize. Okay. Um, now there's a, uh, a question here about, um, I don't know if we go here. I think we should go on to the realism. Somebody says that the, they uh, always thought that life is sweet had a heightened sense of compression of reality. Well, I suppose that's a little bit what you're talking about, about naturalism and, and realism, isn't it? So is this a conscious decision to represent um, diegetic time? Okay, I'm getting quite technical here. Well, I'm not sure what that, <laughs> I don't know what that means quite. Um, what does it mean? I'm assuming, well, maybe anonymous attendee, you could actually give us a bit of a glossary on that. But uh, I love it. I always thought love is a bit of heightened sense. The compression of reality. Okay. Um, well, so rather than doing it in actual real, real time, what I thought heightened reality is kind of distilling it down. I think the question was, is it deliberate? That's what the question yeah. was. Yes. It's, it's, and the answer is yes. But, but I would, uh, I mean, we should just um pursue that a little bit um when the questioner says is it deliberate uh it, it's deliberate in the sense that as an artist one knows what one's doing but on the other hand it's not a kind of cynical piece of manipulation it's a just and it's a decision you make partly carefully and consciously but it's also it comes out of one's instinct and the one one's response to the material or the response to what one's one's instinct about what's trying to say i mean you know any sort of artist in any medium um the style or the way that he or she whether it's a novel or a painting or whatever the way in which an artist distills what is just reality um into their own particular particular um uh, uh, substance and subject matter and, and stuff it comes from the artist's instinct and the way the artist responds both to the to the subject matter and also to the material the, the medium you're working with so um to me life is sweet which is what we're talking about is absolutely real but there is a heightened edge to it and in certain parts of it, it and the same is true of its predecessor, um, High Hopes, my feature film, which um, where the central couple um, are kind of the heroes of the film in a way, and they are looked at in a quite in a more natural way than the neighbours next door and the or the brother and sister. They're, they're slightly more they're slightly more heightened, um, almost caricature. Uh, but it isn't quite that element. And th those are sort of artistic choices that come out of, you know, careful thinking about what it is, but also an instinct about how to, re how to tell the story and respond to the material. Yeah. So um, another anonymous person is asking, what's your approach to exploring contradictions? Though I'll be interested to know whether you think these are contradictions. Uh, for example, interweaving humour into the often very cold, harsh reality, they say, portrayed in your films. Well, quite often I've been asked, how do, you how do I decide when, when, it's, when to be funny and when to be serious? And the bottom line is, I don't. You don't need to. Life is comic and tragic and with respect to the question of what he or she is referring to whichever scene or film it may be it's there's it's a compound um chemistry of com comedy and tragedy which life is life is tragic and hilarious and don't ask me to say in what measure it just is, and that's how it is. Yeah. 
and when you're least expecting either of those things, it usually turns, takes that turn <laughs> the other way, doesn't it? So, okay, so the question here possibly from an actor, I don't know, which is, uh, do you think an actor acts better when there is no script? Although, again, that phrase, is no script, is, is probably something you might take issue with. Um, but the supplementary question to that is, isn't it very frightening for the actor? Well, here's the thing. I, I suspect the question absolutely does come from an actor. Um, first of all, there are two questions here. The first question is, is it better? The answer is no. Nobody's saying it better. I'm not. Great movies have been made with great scripts, working with the script being written first and then interpreted uh, in the shoot, as indeed great plays have been written and then interpreted in the rehearsals and performed on the stage. That's not in question. Um, my own particular way of um, operating um, deploys improvisation with actors in order to create a world in a completely three-dimensional way out of which we can then distill and construct the film or the play. What the questioner is referring to very legitimately when he or she says, isn't it frightening for an actor? Um, what what they're referring to is the unquestionably terrifying convention of actors being asked cold without any preparation of any kind to get up and be interesting, be fascinating, be inventive, invent a story, make it, make it interesting, make something happen, which is a characteristic of all kinds of improvisation workshops and situations and indeed some kinds of performance. I think that's horrible and uh, negative and um, danger, uh, frightening and a waste of time. It isn't what happens in my things where there's very slowly the character is talked into existence and then a character is, is individually created and explored so that the actor gets to know the, who the character is and how to play the character. And then actors are put together in situations where the number one rule is stay in real time, don't try and make anything happen, just, and it's done not in front of an audience, it's done in a very closed environment, so that gradually it grows organically, so that the time you get to performance uh, in the film, or indeed on the stage, it's absolutely, the actors and the actors are together, very solid and um, grounded with foundations in the work. So the, the notion of improvisation being frightening doesn't really, um, it's dealt with. Yeah, but it's not a cosy process either, because, you know, Timothy Spall writing in your book, um, not about, you know, talking, uh, being interviewed for your book, talks about the challenge and how it can be, if not frightening, but, you know, it requires a great deal often of the actor that they do have to go to places that are extremely challenging. Yes, of course. Um, and the whole point is, as far as I'm concerned, is, and actors that I work with are concerned, is it's a grown up. Uh, serious matter of creating a real people in a real world, you, you know, fictitious though they are. And of course, yes, it absolutely demands, you know, it's not, it's not easy, but it's, it's not, it isn't hard because it's frightening because there isn't a script. It's, it's, it's some um, hard work, uh, but actors find it extremely stimulating. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's my attitude to it is I, I treat actors as fellow artists, creative artists in their own right, which on the whole, but they are creative and so on, and just interpreting a script isn't as creative as being involved in, you know, in the whole thing. So this is, a, I suspect, another question from an actor, which is, do you find there's a big difference between theatre acting and film acting? And are there methods that theatre actors employ which are particularly useful in film acting? Well, I mean, fundamentally, acting is acting, it, certainly in the context of my sort of work. Um, I mean, obviously, there are... I mean, the question is, is on the case a little bit, because... Um, Actors who have plenty good experience of theatre are used to the idea of thoroughly rehearsing thoroughly over a sustained period of time. 
actors who have only ever been in films are not used to the concept of rehearsing at all. And very many films are hardly rehearsed. I mean, one of the problems of filmmaking is that people are under rehearsed or not rehearsed at all, or it's the idea of having, I mean, we spent six months preparing uh, properly, you know, um, and even then we, that doesn't mean we've arrived at a script. That means we're prepared to go on out on location and make the film up. Um, so I think theatre actors have got the experience of preparation. But in the end, acting is acting is acting. And um, if they can act, they can act. And of course, I work really with character actors, which is to say people that don't just play themselves, people that are good at and like and want to play real people out there in the street. Um, but that isn't a distinction between theatre actors and film actors. That's, you know, that character actors are character actors. Um, okay, now there's a, there's a number of questions here, which are really about the current political climate um, generally. So um, Rosie Boycott, for example, is asking how you cope with woke culture. Good question, Rosie. <laughs> um, but we'd expect nothing less, Rosie. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, well... I've had problems with it. Um, I'm very concerned with not so much myself, but young filmmakers, for example, mm. who are particularly from public funding bodies um, up against um, excesses of woke, which I find uh, questionable to say the very least which is to say, you know, um, why is your cinematographer, a young filmmaker was asked, why is your cinematographer a man? And the cinematographer had worked, th these two guys had worked together successfully on a number of projects to which the, the director had to say, well, because he's not a woman, basically. Um, you know, uh, box ticking is, I mean, nobody disagrees with diversity, of course, but when it over when box ticking overtakes the natural um, inclination to what people want to say and what they want to look at and look at the world and reflect on and so forth, then it becomes unhealthy. So that really is what I would say about that. Okay. Um, now there is somebody else has also asked. I'm just trying to see whether they're. Um, about whether you feel that in this age, of, oh, it's anonymous, that's, that's right, that's why I can't find the name. Um, how does Naked, do you think now, in terms of you think of uh, the context of Me Too, is that for you? Does but, that... I mean, I, I think the, the, the questioner needs to come out and say what he or she thinks about this. <laughs> okay, anonymous attendee. Give us another question. No, no, no. What does what does he or she think about naked in the context in the Me Too context? Well, obviously, that the, at the time there were there were some you know, arguments. Then, in terms of the, the way that, that women appeared on screen, I mean, you can also argue that is exactly the point of it: the way the women were treated. But there were some there was there was some noise at the time, wasn't that from? There was. Time. Interestingly, it evaporated after a yeah. number of years. Um, uh, and I think the important thing is to is to actually look at what really is going on in the film. And there is a character in the film, not the central character, but the landlord in the film, whose behaviour is unquestionably um, misogynist in the extreme. Um, and that really is, as much as anything, there to really um, allow you to think carefully about how you respond to the central character, who is not, in that sense, misogynist, but that, you know, there's a lot of complex behavior of various kinds. And it, it would be, it is a complete, um, uh, it's, it's disingenuous in the extreme to say that the film, as in the women in the film, as was said when it first was released, are all doormats. It just isn't true. And that is a dangerous um, generalization, which is, does not uh, suggest actually really 
um, looking at and understanding, looking at and understanding the movement. Well, um, to go to another part of the political landscape, uh, Yale, who's sending warm wishes from Washington, DC. Yeah, Yale. <laughs> he's there, uh, is this wonderful discussion, and uh, thanks, thanks for it. And he's, but he's eager to know if you think that Vera Drake could be reshown in the United States given the abortion rights issue. Uh, hello, Yael, it's Yael, and she's a woman. Oh, and um, uh, of course, it would be great for it to be reshown in the United States because of the abortion issue, no question. Well, um, yeah, but do you think it, it's, I think it's more, is it? You know, would it be more difficult to be shown widely across the United States? No. That I don't know. I can see why it might be. Yeah. And I would like to think that uh, people would have the courage and the, you know, strength to overcome such nonsense. But yeah, the great of it was. And yeah, Ellen, I apologies for um, getting your name and indeed gender wrong there. So Tony Edwards is wondering about um, Mr. Turner the research sources that you were able to examine. And um, he says, please tell us about how you understood him. Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. He's a very complicated, complex character, which is really why I thought it would make a great, um, I ought to make a film about him. I mean, the tension between this extraordinary, epic, spiritual um, work, and his vision and this, on the face of it, curmudgeonly eccentric character uh, is fascinating. Actually, if the question is, and I think it is, is how I understood him, Turner, the man, you know, having been around creative, alternative, beatnik, hippie, dropout, anarchic, um, dirty, contentious, uh, ironic, sarcastic, um, et cetera, et cetera, characters throughout the last uh, long, many a decade. Um, one could easily understand, to a considerable extent at least, what this guy, this artist was about. You know, artists don't conform. And what Turner was, was a non-conformist. He was part of the establishment, but also an outsider in the establishment. Hmm. That's the sort of answer to the question, I think. And in terms of um, the sort of research resources, of course, you had a particular historical consultant, as you have had on, on Peter Lou as well, didn't you, for Mr. Turner? Yeah. Jacqueline Riding, who is a is a, was a, is actually an, an art historian, and who was with us and led us in all sorts of directions. And without her, it wouldn't have been possible to to make the film. Really, yes, of course. Question now from Darren Gross, who says all or nearly all of your films have what's referred to as a transforming moment or turning point where the emotional threads climax. When devising your films in the early stages with actors before filming, um, as you do you usually establish the transforming moment first and then work backwards, or do you find it along the way? Is it uh, you know, is it in the back of your head all the way through development? This sounds like somebody about writing a screenplay to me. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, were I to write screenplays conventionally, uh, sit down, write it, and then interpret it in the filming, then probably well, people that do that, that's what they do. That, that moment that Darren is talking about uh, is in the script. Mm -hmm. But because what we do, I mean, the preparatory work, as I've already said, but probably not in enough detail to make the point, the work we do before we start shooting is not to construct the film, it's to construct the premise of the film. Or the, so that the, it's the journey of making the film, of bit by bit, shoot, um, defining it and shooting it as we go along, that makes, it, makes the journey of making the film a journey of discovery as to what the film is. And so the transformative moments that um, uh, Darren is talking about come out of that on the journey. 
I certainly don't start by saying, right, here's a transformative moment. Let's construct a film around that transformative moment because that is uh, that will be nonsense and it absolutely doesn't happen. But it grow, the thing grows and you arrive at, and some of those transformative moments, uh, most importantly, come out through long, long improvisations, exploring all the characters and what, you know, like the climax of, um, uh, of uh, Secrets and Lies, for example, where all the truth comes out, um, which I then take and organize and distill into dramatic material. So, okay, so my question, I mean, has it ever, completely taken you by surprise? Always. Always. Well, no, it does, because that's the whole thing. But, you know, here's the thing. To go back to something I, I kind of implied a bit earlier on, um, I mean, how many novelists have you heard say, well, I don't, didn't know what was going to happen? I, you know, the, the characters dictated to me what should happen next. And you know, I suddenly thought, you know, let's just see what happened. You know, and painters, you know, put a mark on the canvas, you don't know what it is, and gradually it tells you what's next and so on and so forth. And same with sculptors and musicians. And, and that's what I do. Uh, uh, that's what we do. And I do it with the, you know, I interact with the material. David's wondering how much your process is dependent on your own personality and the trust that actors and other creative people have in you um, and how you'll work and to what extent are you conscious of that, he wonders. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, in a way, this is a question that it's not for me to answer. <laughs> but if I was a really beastly person who didn't know how to get on with people and was totally disorganised and um, uh, was aggressive and all those other things, then I don't think I would have... Um, <laughs> It wouldn't have wouldn't have worked basically. I mean, apart from the particular way that I work, I mean, if you're going to be a director uh, 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 in any serious way, with uh, and if you're going to work with not only actors but with everybody behind the camera as well, you know, directing apart from the content or the subject matter is also about being, um, you know, able to chair. The thing to, 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 to you know to be responsible for organizing the thing and, and to be sensitive and to, to know how to shut up when you should shut up and how to encourage and how to be supportive and all those things quite apart from the subject matter so you know, i hope that's an answer to your question the question sort of demands me to start being um self-congratulatory and i don't want to do that too much because I don't think it's very healthy. <laughs> um, an honest question, how many ideas of films do you develop but subsequently abandon? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it happens. Um, I mean, during, lo <laughs> during mm -hmm. lockdown, I had several ideas which I've sort of, but it, it, abandoning it is, the thing is, again, my films in many ways are, there are lots of ideas on the go in all of them. Uh, they're they're multi, multifaceted in a way. So it's, you know, but uh, you know, I had a couple of notions during lockdown, which I now think uh, other things are more interesting, but they're only starting points really. So it's a question that I can't really answer very much. But do strands, of, as it were, of the DNA of one project sometimes find their way into another one? Maybe, yes. Well, I mean, you know, if you look at my films, you can see, apart from anything else, you can see ongoing preoccupations. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to name them? Well, I mean, you know, living and dying and <laughs> surviving and have, having parents and having children and not having children and whether to have children and, um, yeah. you know, work and uh, all those things. Yeah. Um, Darren, Darren's back again and wonders whether there are any movie genres um, that you enjoy, but you wouldn't have any interest in directing. Well, I mean, uh, um, I don't really, apart from anything else, I don't particularly think in terms of genres. Um, and uh, I mean, there are movies and movies and um, uh, uh, I don't make, I mean, certainly uh, 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 I'm not the kind of filmmaker, and there are filmmakers who do this and do it very well and uh, great respect for them, who actually deal in this is this in this genre, this is in that genre. I mean, I suppose you have to say that my own films are have got their own kind of genre, I suppose. <laughs> um, 
But, but then I, you made the costume, you know, then you make that tr trilogy of 19th century pictures and people are quite surprised by that. So that seems to go outside it. I think the genre of those films is the, it's the same genre as my contemporary film, <laughs> yeah. actually, when the chips are down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so uh, there is, okay, there's a question about younger filmmakers, and I wonder whether you could actually broaden that out to sort of general view of the health of British cinema. I mean, obviously, extraordinary period, but generally in terms of, you know, younger filmmakers coming along, any particular kind of words of wisdom that you would like to impart to them? I mean, the good news is... Yeah. The, the, sorry, the bad news. Let's start with the bad news. I've already referred to some bad news, yeah. which is the trouble young filmmakers have with getting funding that isn't where the films aren't interfered with. And I've already referred to that. The good news is that technology, the technology is there to go out and make a film. I mean, when I was a young filmmaker, you had to get your hands on a movie camera, you had to get your hands on film stock, you had to be able to afford the laboratories, et cetera, et cetera, which I afford cutting room to cut it. Now you can, I, I don't want to get into the better whether you should, but you can make a film on your phone, you know. Uh, uh, so in terms of the tools, yeah, the access is there. And there are huge, there's a huge number of young filmmakers doing really interesting, and exciting things. And I think it's good news. I mean, when we made Abigail's party at the BBC in 1975, 1977, sorry, 1977, we were in a sort of post-production uh, suite. And there was a gold guy from the BBC there and he said, film is dead. <laughs> 1977. By 1990, he said, there will be no film. Film is on its way out. And at that time, we kind of thought, well, that's probably true. And it wasn't. Not only is film not dead, but movies certainly aren't dead. I mean, so there's a great proliferation of all sorts of stuff going on. Of course, we know that there are, there's world cinema with all kinds of very exciting things happening um, where people are pointing the camera at real things. And there's Hollywood which is a separate world, basically. But the question was about British activity. And there is a lot of very interesting, there are a lot of interesting things going on and need to be encouraged. I'm not, I'm not going to name names. No, fair enough. Um, we are pretty much out of time. So that I'm actually going to come to what would be my last question, but I'm also going to wrap a bit of Rosie Boycott because it's on a, on a similar line, which is actually about the streaming services, big streaming services. And it follows on really from what you're saying as well. She's wondering about um, what is the influence on filmmakers of, you know, Netflix and other big streaming services. Um, does it actually make making film films for the cinema harder? Um, but I'm wondering, you know, again, whether you think that 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 will make great longer term will make greater inroads into actual theatrical distribution. Well, first of all, we know that. Um... I mean, there's one, one issue is the survival of cinemas, where people can sit in a communal situation and watch film. And what, what, obviously we all just hope that um, streaming services and indeed all kinds of ways of watching movies in your house, uh, your home, I should say, um, d don't kill the cinema, the communal film going experience. And also the big screen and Dolby Stereo and all of that stuff. Um, my last film, Peterloo, was backed by Amazon Studios, who were very generous and didn't interfere with it at all. Uh, so that's one positive thing. On the other hand, I've just been turned down for a film by Netflix. Uh, just to repeat that in case anyone missed it, I've just been turned down by Netflix for a film. And um, I think that's a shame because I think they have the money to stimulate stuff and there's no reason why they shouldn't support filmmakers of all kinds, myself included. Um, so I think the jury is out to a degree and um, uh, it's very hard to know where we're going to wind up. 
And of course, the pandemic has compounded this situation specifically. But, you, I mean, you would say, though, however, I mean, you would still welcome the fact that you can reach a greater audience that way, uh, even if it means possibly a slightly shorter time in cinemas. Yes, indeed, but then I, I've been there before. I mean, the yeah. much maligned Abigail's party, when it was broadcast for the third time in, in the UK during a massive storm throughout the British Isles, um, when there was a very boring intellectual programme on... Uh, BBC Two, uh, and um, there was a strike on ITV. Sixteen million people watched Abigail, and there was there were only three channels at that time. So, yeah, and every time we made one of those so-called play for today films, we had you know seven, eight, nine, ten million viewers. Now you'd have, you know, that's quite a big deal for a movie. So yeah, that's true, and I think it's not to be underestimated. Well, look, this is the moment for me to apologise to those uh, people that, where we haven't got to your questions, but to thank you anyway for putting, sending them in and everybody whose questions we did use. Um, and Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Francine, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you both, Mike and Francine, for this brilliant discussion. And thank you for everybody's incredible questions. I'm so glad that we managed to bring in so many of them. Um, it's been so enriching, wide ranging, and just such an honor to have um, Mike Lee with us, one of our most original and brilliant filmmakers. So the BFI retrospective is going to be um, from the 18th of October to the 30th of November. And you'll have a chance to see some of these extraordinary films and uh, screenings and Q&As um, also happening. So please do have a look at that. And Mike Lee, on Mike Lee, edited by Amy Raphael, is out now from Faber. And we hope that everyone will get a copy. So thank you very, very much, um, both uh, Francine for your brilliant interview and Mike Lee for being with us. Um, it's been a thrill and an honor for us. And we will see you all again soon. But for now, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.